So good morning. This is Chair Rena Moran. Pursuit to House Rule 10.01, I call this remote meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order. Ms. Sparkman, please take the roll for attendance. Chair Moran. Present. Moran, present. Present. Olson, present. Representative Garofalo. Present. Garofalo, present. Representative Albright. Present. Albright, present. Representative Becker Finn. Present. Becker Finn, present. Representative Bernardi. Present. Bernardi, present. Representative Eklund. Present. Representative Hansen. Present. Hansen, present. Representative Hassan. Representative Hassan. Representative Hertos. Hertos, present. Hertos, present. Representative Hornstein. Hornstein, present. Hornstein, present. Representative Johnson. Johnson, present. Johnson, present. Representative Kresha, excused. Representative Liebling. Present. Liebling, present. Representative Lilly. Lilly, present. Lilly, present. Representative Mariani. Representative Mariani. Representative Marquart. Marquart, present. Marquart, present. Representative Miller. Miller, present. Miller, present. Representative Nash. Nash, present. Nash, present. Representative Nelson. Nelson, present. Nelson, present. Representative Noor. Noor, present. Noor, present. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, present. O'Neill, present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, present. Pulowski, present. Representative Petersburg. Present. Petersburg, present. Representative Pinto. Present. Pinto, present. Representative Schumacher, excused. Representative Schultz. Present. Schultz, present. Representative Scott. Present. Scott, present. Representative Sundin. Representative Sundin. Representative Hassan. Representative Mariani. Representative Sundin. Uh, Madam Chair, that concludes the role. There is a quorum present. All right, so a quorum is present. First, I would like to just welcome everyone back as we begin our 2022 legislative session. Uh, it's good to see you all and uh, again, and I'm hoping that we all had a restful interim. So our first agenda item is approval of the minutes from our previous two hearings. The first set of minutes is from my final meeting on, um, of the 2021 special session on June the 27th. Are there any questions or corrections to those minutes? Vice Chair, would you like to approve those minutes? So move, Madam Chair. Thank you. So Representative Olson moves approval of the minutes for June the 27th, 2021. Everyone, please unmute, unmute briefly for a voice vote. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Wonderful. All opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. So the second set of minutes we need to approve comes from December the 16th of 2021, when we were brief on the November budget forecast. Are there any questions or corrections to those minutes? Vice Chair Olson, you'd like to approve those minutes? So moved, Madam Chair. Representative Olson moves approval of the minutes for December the 16th, 2021. Again, please unmute briefly for a voice vote. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Well, members, uh, I just, again, just want to say I'm glad to see you and glad that we are having this meeting. Um, 
And uh, I, I just want us to remember that one year ago, uh, I provided you all with an overview of the report produced by the Select Committee on Racial Justice. And I challenge all of you, all of us, to seize the opportunity to build a state budget through an equity lens. And in many ways, you all rose to this challenge. The budget we assembled in the House of Representatives had an unprecedented focus on dismantling the long-standing disparities facing communities of color living here in Minnesota. We did not tackle every challenge and nor did we succeed in convincing the Senate to join us in adopting each of our proposals. But you know what? There was progress. So today I will have us to reflect on the work that we have done and the work that we have left to do. There is still work to do. At this time, I would like to ask Vice Chair Olson to take the gavel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep. And um, we'd like to also ask Chris to start the slideshow for today's presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you want to proceed with the slideshow and we'll call on testifiers as, uh, as you see fit? Thank you, Vice Chair Olson. So I will be using a recommendation from the select committee as a benchmark for measuring our progress. But we know that the world has continued to change around us since the report came out last year. So I have also invited a number of community experts to tell us how we are doing back out in those communities across the state of Minnesota and what we can still do. I am going to give a quick reminder of how the select committee report was created, and then we're going to walk through the challenges, the accomplishments, and the opportunities that exist in the six different policy areas detailed in the report. So with, with that, let's start with the report. Um, and I, I would just like to say that as we, as I move through this report, I will not be highlighting every part of the report, um, but just, what I consider, you know, the most defined part of the report. So just as a reminder, uh, we formed a House Resolution uh, 1 in 2020 of the second special session, declaring racism to be a public health crisis affecting all Minnesotans. There were six informational hearings from September to December, which was co-chaired by myself and Representative Ruth Richardson and Vice Chair Lisa Damon. A very much of a bipartisan um, led hearing. Um, we discussed data definition. We created historical frameworks regarding systemic racism and disparities. We brought in expert from the pub for public testimony across Minnesota and the United States. And there was a final report that was released on January the 25th of 2021. Next slide, Chris. The Select Committee on Racial Justice Final Reports highlighted the persistent and unacceptable racial disparities in Minnesota, research findings on the rates of racial disparities and the underlying causes, the historical context of government sanctioned policies and practices that facilitate an unequal playing field, but also solutions to reduce and eliminate racial disparities. So the select committee findings consist of and stated that racism is a social system of power to dismantle. We're not talking about individual flaws of individuals, but looking at the systemic pieces of this because we're legislators. Racism saps the strength of a whole society by inefficiently disturbing, distributing resources and opportunity. Improving racial equity is a perpetual goal. It's not something to solve with just a chest checklist. And that is really, really important that we remember that. We can't just check and say, oh, we've done that. We must be done. Committees should make space for hearing proposals that acutely address disparities. And legislation should be assessed through a lens of intersectional racial equity. And so I hope you guys remember this, this visual, which is a great visual in my mind. So we have this unequality. Uh, 
which means unequal access to opportunities, right? We got a tree there, but it's leaning towards the majority. Equality then, to make it work, we want to evenly distribute tools to assistance. So we say, oh, let's do, let's make, let's do an equal thing. Make everything equal across the table, across the process. And even when we give each of them a ladder, because the policy practice in the institution is leaning towards the majority, that equal access does not work. But looking at this through the lens of equity, where we create a process where everyone has the opportunity to reach their fullest potential based on their needs and the needs that's going to create access, we have to have custom tools that identify and address the inequality. As we notice, you know, in order to get that equity, one ladder is a little bit taller than the other to reach that potential. And what justice looks like is that when we are fixing a system to offer equal access to both tools and opportunity. So the system that is bended in one way to create more access to the majority, we have to straighten that so it bends fairly to create a just process. So racial disparity solution, it is the frosting versus the butter. So sustainable solutions require ground floor investment, not band-aid fixes. Racial equity is a lens through which we can view all policies and budget decisions. Through these opportunities to tackle disparities throughout the state budget, there are opportunities to tackle disparities throughout the state budget. In order to tackle these disparities, we have to realize that it is not the frosting that is on top of the cupcake. It is the butter that is in the batter. It is embedded throughout everything that we do to get us to where we need to be to have a more fair and just system. But more importantly, that we are intentionally working to dismantle to reduce the disparities that we see that are inundating, inundating our whole conversations and our narrative of who we are here in the state of Minnesota. So we're gonna open up by talking about economic development. And what I say is that when we talk about systemic racism, sacking the strength of the whole society, that includes the reality that Systemic racism is expensive. There's a cost associated with that. And instead of me walking through this piece of economic development, we definitely have a community expert who um, we've seen and have heard from before. Dr. Bruce Corey will walk us through that whole process. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Corey. Dr. Corey, could you please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony? Chair, Chair, Chair Olson, uh, Chair Moran, uh, and members of the House Ways and Means Committee, my name is Dr. Bruce Corey, uh, Professor of Economics at Concordia University. Uh, with over 25 years, uh, I've been documenting the economic contributions of the Alana BIPOC communities in Minnesota. To me, the importance of the report of the House Select Committee on Racial Justice and the many legislative committees that have deliberated on its recommendation is that racism is real and has a deep negative impact on at least 20% or a fifth of the population of Minnesota, people who need their voice represented in the legislature. One of the principles this country was founded was no taxation without representation. Just our Alana BIPOC workers support at least 24 billion in federal, state, and local taxes. Uh, we can show the slides as we move by. So the, the uh, House Select Committee on Racial Justice documented the, both the tremendous possibilities as well as the gaps that exist uh, because of the impact of racism. Uh, nationally, uh, reports show the uh, a loss in GDP, 
Uh, and as a result, 6 point million jobs were not created. Uh, locally, I've estimated this gap to be about $287 billion in lost income, in lost lifetime earnings, uh, in, in uh, loss in, in long-term wealth, like in home ownership, and also in disparities in state pro, uh, procurement and contracting. Uh, the next slide. So a vibrant ethnic economy of at least $100 million exists in 125 to 138 uh, legislative districts in Minnesota. These ethnic economies can be very visible when you go to Litchfield Avenue in Wilmar, many areas in Duluth, the many cultural malls in St. Cloud, the Rochester Medical Destination Center, and the commercial corridors in Worthington, Fairbold, Wyndham, Winona, Albert Lee, Baxter, Little Falls, Wet Wing, and Moorhead. I know it because we documented the vibrancy of these ethnic economies all across Minnesota in a video that can be found on the site culturaldestinations.org. The Alana BIPOC communities from across Minnesota are asking the legislature, the governor, the judiciary to ensure their interests are represented in the laws, policies, and programs in Minnesota. This session is a historic opportunity to right the wrongs and put in place a strong, inclusive wealth building infrastructure in Minnesota to transform the 287 billion racial disparity gap to an opportunity to grow the Minnesota economy by the amount. As you can see in the last session, there's a lot of progress in the program that were funded and that were listed as well as other investment in cultural malls and inclusive programs like the targeted community capital program and the Main Street Revitalization program. We could also see an intentional inclusion in the way these programs have been implemented in the various state agencies, such as DEED, the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, the Minnesota Department of Education, and the Office of Higher Education. While these investments are important, they're not at the scale and scope that is needed to, to build and transform the ethnic economy. So to continue the momentum of the last legislative session, next slide, we could do what a well-managed business or organization does, invest part of their revenue on the product development and workforce skills that will sustain and grow the organization. So in Minnesota, Alana BIPOC businesses in 2012, the last time the census had comprehensive data, reported more than 8 billion in sales and employing more than 60,000 people. Collectively, they would be one of the largest employers in Minnesota. If we just take 10% of the value of their sales and invest that money in wealth building tools from various kinds of capital, such as loans, grants, equity, alternative finance, and pre-development financing, various kinds of technical assistance from startup to scale up and critical business services, such as accounting, legal service, and insurance. These areas are crippling many businesses as could be seen in the recent PPP experience. And opening up markets such as public contracts and private and virtual markets and creating uh, productive spaces such as business incubators and accelerators and investing in cultural assets. Similarly, when we look at the workforce, we find that over half a million of Alana BIPOC workers are playing a critical role in many sectors from manufacturing to healthcare. A report that we'll be releasing soon estimates that these workers contribute almost 200 billion in product and services produced in Minnesota. And as I mentioned earlier, 24 billion in taxes. We recommend that we take a tiny amount of what they contribute to the economy, less than 1%. Of, so around 200 million and invested in creating a modern workforce needed all across Minnesota. This can be invested in skill development, language proficiency and career pathways, especially in the STEAM D occupation that is science, technology, engineering, including clean energy, energy, arts, math, and the digital technologies. A recent report of DEED brings the new reality to the fore. The aging population will create huge workforce gaps in Minnesota and the Lana BIPOC workers can fill those gaps. Take for example, the utility industry where there's not much diversity in workers. 27% of that workforce is over 55 years. This is the area of clean energy and offers a huge opportunity for Minnesota. We also ask for a special focus on Alana Bipark Women and Girls, effective wealth creating and skill building strategies reflected in the Women of Color Act, 
and that this act, uh, that this bill passed this session. The pandemic has also taken a huge toll on Alana BIPOC women and girls, and this legislation should be a top priority. Again, the timing is right. Employees are willing to make changes. And so some uh, priorities such as banning salary history, uh, rethinking the credential-based hiring system are all uh, the need of the ER. Further, we can see the private and non-profit sector making big investments from the Bush Foundation to leading banks. The legislature could help this private and not, could help leverage this private and nonprofit investment. The urgency of now is upon us. We're looking for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Corey. Chair Moran, do you have anything more on this section of the presentation? No, Madam, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. So we'll move on to the next session. So our section, Chair Moran. All right, members, um, we're gonna move on to looking at the racial disparities that we have seen in housing. Um, and for, for this piece, I mean, we have a community expert who has been in this business around housing for a decade at least. So Madam Chair, would it be okay if I have Miss um, Kizzy Downey um, present on this section? Yes, Chair Moran. So welcome to the committee, Kizzy. If you could please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hey, thank you. Greetings, uh, Chair Olson and Chair Moran and other members of the Ways and Means uh, Committee. Um, again, my name is Kizzy Downey and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Model Cities uh, of St. Paul. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar, Model Cities is a 55 year old organization. We're actually celebrating our 55 year anniversary this year. Uh, and we are a small community based developer, um, but we also provide a number of other services, uh, including overnight emergency shelter, um, housing for families uh, who've experienced homelessness, uh, as well as uh, we are a HUD approved housing counseling agency. Uh, and so we're really, I'm very excited this morning for the opportunity to um, join this conversation and talking about housing disparities. Um, you can um, advance to the next slide. So when we think about when we, we know that with, when it comes to housing stability, um, we know that housing stability is one of the most critical uh, foundations uh, for a person's uh, well-being. And unfortunately, in Minnesota, you know, we know the data uh, tells us that um, housing disparities exist across a continuum of housing options, and home ownership um, is is one of those that has large disparities. And not only do these disparities, um, you know, create issues in terms of um, uh, financial, you know, equity uh, issues in terms of equity for families, um, you know, it also prevents. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me. Home ownership also creates other uh, issues. The, the lack of home ownership creates other issues for families. Um, when we look at the disparities um, in, in terms of home ownership, we know that 77% um, of, of white households in Minnesota have access um, to home ownership. Um, when you look at that in comparison to BIPOC households, you'll see that only about 44% of BIPOC households um, um, are, are homeowners. And this disparities also exists not just in terms of access to home ownership, but also access to affordable uh, neighborhoods. Also, when it comes to um, once a person has a home, being able to, to get um, um, financing uh, or, or refinancing. And then also when it comes to home appraisals, we've, we've um, heard a lot of stories um, even more recently about disparities in terms of home appraisal costs uh, across um, uh, BIPOC communities. Also, when we think about um, housing disparities, we also have to look at affordable rental options as well. Uh, racial disparities in housing, of course, is, is not just uh, in the areas of home ownership. Uh, when it comes to affordable housing, we know that we don't have enough housing, uh, affordable housing units um, in general. Like we, the, the number of units that are needed for extremely low income Households is is two time two and a half times greater than um, what we really need, and so when it comes to renters, of course, uh, renters of color are are more often um, cost burdened um, by housing, uh, which means that they 
you know, often struggle to pay their rent um, when it compared to other um, white households. And then also more recently, the, the recent abrupt end to the um, Rent Help Minnesota um, is, is certainly um, likely to exacerbate the issue uh, that we're already seeing in terms of the, the uh, crisis in terms of housing disparities here in Minnesota. Then also when we think about housing disparities, um, you know, we're not surprised, I think, to see that um, there are disproportionate impacts of, um, across um, homelessness as well when it comes to people of color. Um, particularly African Americans uh, and American Indians are, are overrepresented um, in the homeless um, community. Um, when you think about homelessness, 37% um, of Minnesota's uh, adult population, um, homeless, I'm sorry, 37% of Minnesota's adult homeless population um, was black uh, in 2020, but only, uh, but they only represent about 5%, a little over 5% of the overall population in general. Next slide, please. And so there are a lot of um, accomplishments, like we've talked about the issues and the challenges when it comes to racial disparities in housing. Um, and we know that there have been some um, legislative accomplishments that we don't want to um, forget. Um, you know, there's been um, housing infrastructure bonds um, that have been invested in helping to bring more uh, housing to uh, Minnesotans. Uh, and then also there's been several um, um, housing initiatives that have gotten additional funding um, that have also um, helped to, to create better um, impact for households of color in terms of home ownership. When you think about the Home Ownership Assistance Fund, uh, the Challenge Fund, and other funds that are listed um, here in the slide. Um, even when we look at um, homelessness, we know that there's been um, you know, some large investments um, in terms of uh, new funding to help prevent homelessness um, across our state. Uh, and then also there's been energy assistance um, um, investments made as well, which definitely help low income uh, renters uh, and, and renters of color. If you wanna go to the last slide. Um, but we also know that we still like racial disparities um, you know, in housing also contribute to many other issues across other sectors, um, some of which you've, you will hear about today, uh, education, employment, public safety. And so while we've made a lot of strides uh, in Minnesota uh, when it comes to uh, addressing housing inequities, we, we still have a long way to go. Uh, and we can start by investing more of our state's resources uh, in helping to address this issue. Uh, and um, there are other options as well that are um, likely coming forward during this upcoming uh, legislative session, uh, opportunities to where we can make bigger investments um, to help address these, these issues among BIPOC communities. And some of those include um, making sure that we increase lending uh, for BIPOC communities. So not just creating new programs and um, infusing more money into the programs, but making sure that uh, there are specific targeted um, approaches to address um, BIPOC communities um, in those investments as well. Um, that, that includes, um, you know, coming up with additional alternative financial products um, and then improving services for the unbanked, which definitely impacts our um, BIPOC communities. And then, of course, uh, investing in home ownership education and counseling um, is, is super, very important um, in terms of helping um, um, BIPOC households understand how to navigate the home, home buying process and also helping them to access a lot of the resources uh, that are made available for folks looking to purchase a home. On the, on the production side, um, definitely dedicating additional funds um, to um, support BIPOC uh, real estate investment projects. Um, there are a few, quite a few emerging uh, BIPOC developers and developers that have been around, uh, developers of color that have been around um, and who also currently, uh, you know, lend to helping to create more housing options, but additional resources are needed uh, to support those developers because often in terms of capacity, um, those developers, you know, have less um, capacity to be able to produce more housing 
and need additional resources to be able to do so. And then lastly, of course, being able to just dismantle um, you know, a lot of the practices that has, have contributed to the housing um, disparities in Minnesota is important. And so other options that we should look at this year is um, making sure that our um, you know, uh, folks who are um, fighting evictions, that we have attorneys available for them to help them understand um, their rights and to help them navigate that process. Uh, and then also uh, implementing security deposit caps so that folks who are already cost burden aren't um, missing out on opportunities to even access affordable um, rental because they don't have enough money to secure uh, a deposit. And then also other options around, um, you know, changing our, our screening, uh, uh, screening criteria, making it more uniform. Um, you know, that would help eliminate a lot of the barriers when it comes to um, housing discrimination, um, as well as a, a, a just cause, um, just cause policy for tenancy termination. And then, of course, uh, one that I want to kind of leave with is really looking at an opportunity to offer a statewide rental assistance subsidy program for households earning 50% um, or less of the area median income. Um, we know there's some big bold ask coming through the legislature to really support those households. Um, and the legislature has a, a big opportunity this year to make deeper investments than we have in the past um, to really help address the racial disparities uh, and ensure all Minnesotans, Minnesotans have access uh, to a place they can call home. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Kizzy, and uh, appreciate your work. So we have a question here. I think we'll do the question and we're going to move rapidly through things too and hopefully have some time at the very end, but we'll take them after each uh, presentation if needed here. So this is a great point uh, to ask. So Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually had a question in the previous section too, but we went through it so quickly, but you know, I always have questions. And so as I've been studying the homelessness here in Minnesota for quite some years, um, the most recent um, survey that we did with the Wilder Foundation, they do it in January of every year, which by the way is a horrible month to do it, but they do it in January. And I was really uh, taken aback in this last year as I looked at the data and I'm just gonna round numbers, but out of about the 8,000 or so they found that were homeless, about 4,000 or right around 50% were discharged out of prison. And we know, so I, I do a lot of work within the prison systems, as you know, and I do a lot in public safety. And so that was alarming to say the least. But if you couple that with um, the problem of those uh, in the court systems, whether it's from arrest all the way to incarceration, about 85 to 90% of those have an addiction issue. And the addiction issue is pivotal in their criminality. Uh, there's also a dual diagnosis with uh, mental health disorders. And we see that very heavily in our um, homelessness population. I actually I have home and homelessness court. Uh, we have a special court here in the Metro. Um, I've attended it uh, one full day and was, and I've done, and I've gone to mental health court. And it was interesting the intersection between the two. So we, we just had this long presentation about homelessness and, um, and about uh, inequity in home ownership. But what I didn't hear is this connection between those that are homeless, those that are struggling to buy homes and their ongoing addiction and mental health issues that have been unaddressed. And I'm wondering if the presenter has any thoughts about that and how we can get at that issue. Because that's really the underpinning of quite a bit of the problems um, uh, unaddressed addiction, as I've been trying to deal with it so much in the prison system, um, and then also the mental health issues that are unaddressed. Kizzy, would you like to respond to Representative O'Neill? Sure. Um, thank you, Representative O'Neill, for the for that question. Uh, and I would agree that yes, there are many. Um, you know, there, there are a number of, of, of contributing factors uh, that impact um, individuals and families um, that experience homelessness and certainly mental health um, needs and addiction um, kind of rise to the top of that. Um, one thing that I will also point out is that 
um, oftentimes, like, because we have, have these, um, we, we deal with this as well in terms of the housing that we provide for families uh, that have experienced homelessness. And a lot of times it's really about trying to keep them housed because it's very hard to um, get uh, a family or an individual at, uh, the help that they need around addiction or mental illness if they are not stably housed. And so even though these issues around mental illness and addiction are, are certainly um, important, um, I do want to stress the importance of, 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 of a person having um, a stable place to be able to, to like access all of those services because when they're in transition, um, they're, they're more worried about um, survival and not necessarily um, about addressing those mental health needs or the addiction um, issues that they're challenged with. Thank you. And I'll just remind uh, Representative O'Neill too, we're going to do a part later on behavioral health where some of this may come up as well too, where we'll be able to dive in as well. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I think it's just such a critical conversation and I didn't want this entire presentation on the homelessness to go by without having this really critical conversation because if you want to get at the underpinnings of what is such a challenge, um, so for our prison population, for our those that suffer with mental illness, regardless of color, you know, yes, we have an overrepresentation of BIPOC people in prison, and we also have 85 to 90 percent that are that are in the whole system that struggle with uh, an addiction and sometimes also mental illness. And so I think it's a really critical conversation that we have that we address. Um, those needs as well. Yeah, and of course they need to have a, a safe place to live and to be in order to do those things as well. And I appreciate that. Um, it, that is a huge struggle for those coming out of prison, by the way. There are very few options for them and they often end up on the streets as we found with the Wilder survey just this last January. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. So Chair Moran, uh, would you like to start up the next section? I will, but before I do, I just want to say to uh, Representative O'Neill, you are correct that um, whether we're talking about housing or the a, a job or our educational system, you would see those factors are are just intrinsic, embedded in all of those issues uh, across the spectrum. And you're right, families live and individuals live through all of those stages at one time. And so hopefully as legislators, we would take that type of lens as we begin to look at how we can begin to create more stable lives for individuals in Minnesota. So I, 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 I thank you for that. So we're gonna move on to education. Education, uh, disparity in education begins early in the lives of children in Minnesota and current policies can foster inequities. That was, have we begin in 2021. So, um, and I'm not gonna go through all of these PowerPoints because at the end of the day, you know, we can look at these um, words on paper in this PowerPoint, but we have two expert students that's gonna bring us perspective to the table around our education system and what we are doing or maybe failing to do are continuing to cause the inequities that we see uh, for our students across the state of Minnesota. So, um, so for every indicator, right? So for the, every indicator of success, our BIPOC students are at the bottom. And for every indicator of failure, our BIPOC students are at the top. Uh, so we know that Minnesota BIPOC communities, uh, students are consistently left behind by the nation's worst education opportunity gap. And BIPOC educators have a tremendous effect on students of color, but the pipeline isn't fast enough to get more teachers of color into that pipeline. But we do wanna point out that subjective school disciplinary actions have lifelong consequences. We know that black students are eight times more likely to be expelled than white students. Their early suspension or expulsions, 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 you know what I mean, contributes to the school to prison pipeline. And BIPOC students have disabilities are more likely to face, to face exclusionary practices. And something that may get a black student suspended 
may only lead to a timeout for white students. So we are seeing these inequities in the punishment for same behaviors. So we did go to his have some uh, accomplishment to expand early childhood education, to look at non-exclusionary discipline training funds uh, that will prohibit school suspension for pre-K students. We definitely want to continue to, um, to look at how we're gonna reduce food access inequities, you know, the meal sh uh, shaming. Uh, we, we created new grants and scholarship to expand the pipeline of BIPOC uh, teachers. Uh, and we established a direct mission for the Minnesota pilot programs. So as you can see here, we have some opportunities that we can move forward on. But uh, as you look at this in your own PowerPoint that you have, I would like to allow the students to share with us what those opportunities can be from their lens. Great, so we have two testifiers, two student testifiers. So welcome to the committee. And so I will call on uh, Gori Sood to be our first testifier. So welcome to the committee. So please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Moran, Chair Olson, and members of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, I'm Gori Sood. I'm a senior um, in high school in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm here from both the Rochester Community Initiative and the Olmsted County Youth Commission Youth Groups, but I'm also just here to provide you with a little bit of my own experience. So thank you for having me. So early on last year, I had the opportunity to concurrently volunteer um, teaching in two elementary schools. And one was a well-renowned international school and the other was a trauma-informed public school. I taught this same emotional learning curriculum to both schools and in an attention activity that we did, um, while the international school students knew all the planets and their names, uh, most students from the public school didn't know that Pluto wasn't one of the eight planets. And fast forward 30 years, these disparities are much larger than planets. Obviously, they lead to economic, behavioral, and emotional differences. So I believe social and emotional development is crucial because kids who have had a difficult background have actual physical differences in their brain. And so research shows that of children in poverty, the hippocampus of the brain, the area of um, the memory center shrinks and it makes it more difficult for children to remember well, and that puts them in this cycle, they're caught. So what can stop this? Um, a few things have been shown to physically reverse this change. Um, having nurturing relationships and learning pivotal social and emotional skills can reverse this adverse effect. Learning skills like showing gratitude, using kind words, um, learning how to manage your own emotions, all of these things. Um, and that's how these children can be ready to be at par with others. So there are two solutions within the school systems that I see. And the first is a primary prevention method of social and emotional learning programming for all students, teaching them the emotional and life skills that they need to have that basic foundation to go forward and learn. And social and emotional learning is currently largely in place for those who already have existing support systems. Um, students that are left behind in the cycle should receive these same tools and often more to be at par. And so in an ideal world, this SEL programming would be systemic. But I think the first step and what's achievable is programming that starts for every child in the classroom. The second solution, I believe, is more of a secondary prevention method. And this is resiliency specialists or mental health specialists um, in schools. And so if a child is facing a mental health crisis or they even just need someone to talk to at really any level of schooling, the specialist is trained and available. So I see in my own school and I hear from other schools around as well that many education staff are very overwhelmed with the roles they've been given, especially our counselors. And so allocating a specific position for this provides necessary support. I think education's true purpose of learning and preparation for further life um, is only successfully fostered when every child can feel happy and safe and can manage their emotional lives. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And the next testifier will be Pony White. So welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Pony White and I'm an early childhood policy consultant and a policy lead with the Minnesota Young Women's Initiative. But most importantly, I am a young Minnesota who has attended elementary, middle, high school, and completed my undergrad in the state of Minnesota. I will be speaking on geographic inequities that exasperate racial and class inequities for young Minnesotans. Thank you all for allowing me to speak today. I'm a first-generation West African immigrant 
who grew up predominantly in East Grand Forks, Minnesota, which is a small rural town in greater Northwest Minnesota. My upbringing exposed me to racial, class, and geographic inequities in the Minnesota school system. My education curriculum lacked cultural competency. This looks like students of color making up only 31% of Minnesota student populations, yet receiving 66% of all suspensions and expulsions, largely due to the weaponization of their behaviors. This looks like a third of Minnesota school children identifying as people of color, but only 5% of Minnesota teachers actually being people of color. This looks like English language learners being put in programs that segregate them from their other classmates rather than integrating them into their school community like my high school did. This looks like education, educators not being trained to respond effectively to students and families from varying racial and ethnic backgrounds. While the examples I just listed can also apply to all regions of Minnesota, these inequities are gravely exacerbated in greater Minnesota, a big part due to a lack of funding and the disregard of BIPOC populations in rural Minnesota that is fewer per district than, than the population of BIPOC in the metro. A report from Minnesota House Research shows that metro schools receive $3,000 of $5,000 more per student than schools in western and northwestern Minnesota. If we do the math, we can see that when rural schools are having to make big decisions with smaller budgets, oftentimes BIPOC students and their needs are not always being centered in those decisions because students like me were seen as minorities, leaving someone like me to fall through the cracks of our education system. Fast forward to now, my younger siblings attend school in the metro. They go to Wyzetta High, High School. My siblings are being prepared for college. They have guidance counselor who center their experiences, their upbringings, their family lives. And those are things that I didn't have growing up in rural Minnesota because of the lack of attention, financial support that um, those schools are receiving. So I urge all of you, when we think of equity and we make plans to change the education system in Minnesota, we do not leave rural Minnesota behind. We do not let them fall through the cracks just because they might be considered minorities in those regions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the testifiers for this section. Really powerful and glad you could be here. And so we're going to keep moving right along. So I'll turn it back over to Chair Moran for closing remarks on this section and then moving us into the next one. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Olson. For Chris, Chris, can you put up the um, uh, opportunities for education for one second, please? Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to address one here because there's a lot of conversation about fully funding all schools. And I would like to say, if we're going to do this work through a racial equity lens, through an equity lens, I say we need to fully fund and resource schools with the highest disparities and the lowest BIPOC graduation rate. I think if we're going to make sure that every child is successful, we have to focus. And so, um, and I would just stop there. So Health and Human Service, while Minnesota is one of the healthiest state in the nation, at the same time, it is home to some of the worst health inequities. So the Twin City uh, area life expectancy by race, according to the 2000 uh, census data, as we can see those numbers here, um, there's you know um, some disparities within that. Um, the higher rates of disease from cancer to COVID, the higher mortality rates across the board. BIPOC communities are underrepresented across healthcare professions in general. So we, we do, I do have um, someone here who's going to talk about um, maternal health, specifically black maternal health and where we are within um, that arena. Uh, and then we, uh, we'll also, uh, have someone speak on behalf of behavior health. In the last two years around with COVID-19 uh, and the civic unrest, uh, behavioral health across the board, when I talk to students and others about their well-being, behavioral health is number one. And so I won't go through this. You guys have the note for this. Instead, I would like to have our two presenters pre present. Thank you, Chairman. Would you like, uh, who would you like to go first? Would you like J Mag? Um, J Mag can go first, please. Okay. All right. Great. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself uh, for the record and pr proceed with your testimony. 
All right, will do. Um, I am Jay Matt Carpia. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Um, Chris, could you put the slides back up? Uh, thank you. Um, and, and today, as, as um, Representative Moran mentioned, I'll be talking about Black maternal health and what I see as policy opportunities um, in this upcoming session. Um, next slide. Uh, so I, I'd like to highlight particularly in the context of my work looking at um, both racial inequities, but also looking at um, perinatal and infant um, inequities where I see substantive opportunities in this next session, thinking first about the elimination um, of the use of race-based medicine in medical schools and, and facilities and its impacts. Um, next, thinking more about investment in recruitment and retention of BIPOC healthcare providers who we know are severely underrepresented and who we also know from the literature can have substantive impacts on perinatal and infant health outcomes. And lastly, thinking um, outside of the clinical care encounter uh, and thinking about birthing people specifically and how expanding coverage for comprehensive postpartum visits can actually save lives, lives that we know are particularly vulnerable in, in the year after um, delivery and after pregnancy. Uh, next slide. A little bit of background. Um, so in our country, it's a little difficult to see on this slide, but we know, as Rep. Moran, Moran mentioned, there are glaring disparities in both maternal mortality and infant mortality. And in the history of our country, so over, over the entire period that we've been able to collect data, at no point have Black mothers had the same health outcomes as white mothers. And this is despite technological improvements, and this is despite nutritional improvements, we know that um, continuously Black mothers have worse outcomes than their white counterparts. And so this is looking from 1960 to 2022, Black moms are, are actually more likely to experience um, pregnancy-related mortality today than they were um, when during emancipation in 1860. Um, so these, these are inequities that, that persist regardless of education. These are inequities that exist regardless of healthcare access. Um, we continually see Black moms having worse, um, worse outcomes than their white counterparts. Um, next slide. And when we look at, so this is data from the CDC, when we look at when pregnancy-related deaths occur um, throughout the, an individual's pregnancy experience, we see that the mass, um, about a quarter of these fatalities happen during pregnancy, which is in the lightest gray. But we also see an equal amount happening in the period 43 to 365 days postpartum. Um, we know that our, our legislature has made significant improvements to expand uh, postpartum Medicaid coverage, expanding this coverage from um, not just 60 days, but um, pushing for a full year of postpartum coverage, which is extremely um, valuable considering this chart that we see here, where a lot of the, of the maternal losses we're, we're seeing are happening in the postpartum period and are not due, um, as folks may, may think, to um, dramatic experiences at the time of delivery. But if um, we move to the next slide and thinking about why it's important to have an explicit racial justice or explicit health equity focus within um, perinatal care, we know that these birth outcomes we see, as I talked about, the persistence in these racial inequities are not due to individual behavior, but rather systemic failures. Um, we know that racialized beliefs within the patient care setting often influence um, the experiences of Black mothers. Uh, a highly publicized example was that of Serena Williams um, when she had her child wherein she felt unwell and tried to communicate this to her care team. They did not believe her and thought that she was overreacting to the pain that she experienced. It was only due to extensive self-advocacy that they finally listened to her and just narrowly caught a pulmonary embolism that could have killed her um, and forever changed um, the life of her her partner and her child. And, and this is not one off belief of a, of a famous person. There are documented instances across um, the academic literature, but also within social publications about how Black women when seeking care are often not believed. Um, I, I fail to remember the woman's name, but a woman seeking, emergent, in a, seeking care um, in an emergency room due to pregnancy related complications was sent home and told, um, was escorted out of an ER by, by officers because they thought she was making it up and didn't need to be there and would go home and, and within, within the next 
24 hours died due to pregnancy related complications. Although she had sought medical care was not believed and was sent home. And this, this bias that we see black women experiencing is due um, explicitly to what's been documented in the literature as empathy gap where providers due to these deeply ingrained ideas about black inferiority and black difference are less likely to believe black patients when they when they voice experiences of pain or when they voice discomfort. And, and so what we often see is um, not just anecdotal stories of, of, of black mothers re re receiving differential treatment, but when we look at the data, we, we see that black mothers are less likely to receive um, appropriate pain assessment than their right counterparts and are much less likely um, to receive pain management um, support um, when, when faced with the same physiological um, symptoms and presentation as their white counterparts. Um, and so we also know that this empathy gap in these ideas about Black people being either drug seeking or um, being somehow physiologically more impervious to pain also show up um, in, within the care setting as well and, and are deeply influenced by these racialized ideas about Black physical difference. Um, and, and I present all this information again to stress the need for us to be very intentional about addressing race-based medicine um, and its practices within medical schools and facilities, uh, because we know that it's, it's not just an unpleasant experience, but the lack of empathy and the lack of equal treatment often harms Black mothers and contributes significantly to the increased risk of pregnancy-related mortality, especially in this vulnerable postpartum period. Um, a, a second um, opportunity in thinking about the clinical, um, how racism shows up in the clinical, clinical care setting um, is, is on this next slide here, Chris, um, where we know also it's not just experiences of Black moms, but this, this deep, deeply troubling empathy gap also has severe consequences for Black infants. Um, in, a, in a study published in 2020, through a national survey of medical records and that looked at both physician identity, uh, racial identity, and the racial identity of a pregnant person, we saw that Black infants um, had better health outcomes when treated by racially concordant, concordant providers. Um, what this means is that when Black moms have Black doctors, their babies do better and they do better. And, and we know that although this is a wonderful opportunity, it's, it's one that's difficult for us currently in the state of Minnesota because we have such a strong underrepresentation of providers of color. And, and looking at this data and having this quantitative evidence that suggests that increasing workforce diversity has substantive impacts on this population, um, it's clear to see why this is a session opportunity and why it's, it's urgent for us to invest in the recruitment and retention of more BIPOC health providers. Um, I'm trying, I will be cognizant of time, but my last, last slide, thinking about the postpartum period, again, going back to what we know about when pregnancy-related mortality occurs, it's, it's urgent for us, again, to um, expand not only postpartum coverage, but also think about how we space out postpartum checkups. Um, thinking currently, postpartum women receive a six-week checkup, and we know that oftentimes this may lead to catching problems too late in the postpartum period. Um, I offer the example of um, a patient experience at a Roots Birth Center here in Minneapolis, where a patient, because of this birth center model that's significantly different from this traditional hospital model and instead encourages postpartum visits 24 hours, 48 hours, and two weeks rather than six weeks after, um, after, after delivery, um, a provider was able to catch what could have been a potentially fatal deep vein thrombosis and that could have resulted in maternal mortality. Um, and so what we see is that oftentimes waiting six weeks is too late. And, and so encouraging um, and offering expanded comprehensive postpartum coverage allows yet another opportunity to save, um, save postpartum mothers, but especially Black mothers who we know are disproportionately impacted by pregnancy-related mortality. Um, and I, I will end there and, of course, welcome questions later in the... In Thank this. you for your testimony. We appreciate it. So we will move to the next testifier in this section, Dr. Bravada. Please uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, again, good morning. My name is Dr. Bravada Garrett Akinsanya. I am a licensed clinical psychologist 
with over 40 years of experience in the field of mental health. I've been serving clients whose ages range from birth till death, and I am a fellow of the American Psychological Association and a board certified diplomat and fellow of the National African American, oh, National Association of Black Psychologists. I also am president of uh, and executive director of the African American Child Wellness Institute, and that is a Rule 29 nonprofit community mental health center. It's located in North Minneapolis, as well as in Plymouth. ACWI's mission is to promote the psychological and spiritual liberation of children of African descent. And we do that work by providing culturally specific mental health services and by developing access to culture-based holistic wellness resources, research and practices. In my experience as a psychologist, as I've said, it's been more than 40 years. One of the things I've seen in leadership as president of the Minnesota Psychological Association and also as a past president of the Association of Black Psychologists, I know that we have to make sure that in our writing, in our presentations, in our community outreach, that we bring in the culturally relevant information. So one of the things that I specialize in is doing community teaching. And I look at issues of trauma, community violence, multiculturalism, poverty, homelessness, severe psychopathology, but mostly I, I ex hold expertise in African-American mental health. Now, we know right now that there's a shortage in mental health providers of all types, but especially among African, those of African descent. With our average age of the current providers around 64 years old. So we also have those problems because some of the systemic issues like developing pipelines to mental health field exist with barriers like low admission to graduate programs, um, high burdens of student loan repayment, culturally biased licensing exams, all that require several times before we can pass them. And with that in mind, I believe that I can speak authoritatively about the opportunities as well as the challenges in the areas of behavioral health that pertain to African-American community. First, it's no secret to anyone that African-American children and families in Minnesota experience severe disparities in multiple systems, including education, foster care, juvenile justice, and mental health. Sadly, a recent uh, Minnesota student survey revealed that while 15% of Black ninth grade youth reported having long-term, long-term mental health problems, and behavioral and emotional difficulties. They said that their problems lasted more than six months, but only 9% of them ever had been treated during the whole year after that, after that information was known. These systemic practices have deleterious impact on the lives of African-American youth and families. And as an example, I'd like to specifically address some of the key issues such as safety, trauma, suicide, drug abuse, and exposure to violence that kind of highlight what I'm talking about when I address these issues. According to one of our most recent Minnesota student surveys for the eighth, ninth, and 11th grade students, Black youth were found to, uh, to found that 52%, that they were 52% more likely than their white counterparts to report feeling unsafe going to, to and from school. African-American children were also 33% more likely to report feeling unsafe at school once they got there, and 71% more likely to wrote, report feeling unsafe in their neighborhoods and in their communities. Now, if you're a child and you're going to school and you have these many feelings of unsafety, we know as psychologists that people either fight, flight, free, or surrender. So if you're in school trying to learn something, that tells us right now why it's difficult for them to focus and be involved in school when school in itself is a scary place. And as we know from local incidents of children getting shot this past week, we know that school and mental health, they are very important to ex explore together. 
we saw that our children reported witnessing violence among adults in their families, 57% more often than their Caucasian counterparts. Furthermore, furthermore, Black youth identified using marijuana or other drugs almost twice as often as their white peers. They also reported living with people who use illegal drugs or abuse prescription drugs 26.3% more often than their white peers. We know also additionally that their adverse childhood experiences they met, that we know measured or described the traumatic episode as we talk about trauma now in a person's life that occurs before age 18. We know that four or more score uh, points in, are a, in these adverse childhood ex episodes or experiences, four or more of them every, actually contribute to a problematic trajectory that they can last as far as a lifetime that can lead to multiple health challenges, including an early death. According to our Minnesota students survey, black youth are 31.4% more likely than their white counterparts to have more, more than four ACEs. Therefore, they're likely to experience trauma in a more severe manner. And to make matters worse, black youth are 25% more likely to report having made an attempt of suicide than their white counterparts. And this is new data because traditionally African-American children did not practice or engage in um, death by suicide attempts at, at a rate that was larger than those of a white counterpart. So I have solutions that I'd like to share for a moment. Firsthand, and I, I'm gonna talk about it because I know firsthand when we address these problems with the aim of moving black youth and families from a perspective of being at risk to being at promise, the trajectory drastically change. So some of the things I'd like to recommend that we need as we move forward, I believe you have the slide, very good. We need to establish carve outs for African-American community to serve children, youth and adults as they attempt to navigate systems in which they are overrepresented and underserved, such as carve out for school link mental health. We also talk about expanding culturally specific and comprehensive mental health services for supported ancillary services such as CTSS and ARMS for adults. We'd like to see an increase in the number of licensed mental health providers of African descent in the workforce because we are overrepresented uh, and underserved so that they learn in culturally congruent ways through training and supervision, how we can go back to our own communities, communities and bring healthy lifestyles that are congruent to our values. We also see that we need to see a support to at-risk parents, whether they face circumstances including poverty, mental illnesses, substance abuse, and physical health challenges. And finally, we want to support groups and agencies that provide culturally specific behavioral health services in their community. Our research says, when, and it was alluded to earlier, shows us that if students and families can actually access culturally specific services, that their treatment outcomes are better, their need for treatment reduces, and they say that they have coping mechanisms that go way past the date of treatment. So finally, I would like to implore the group to support the development of innovative collaborative models for service delivery among people of African descent. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you very much to both our testifiers on the health and human services slides. And so with that, we're going to move along to our public safety and we'll go straight to testifiers. I do believe Chair Moran, is that correct? That is correct, uh, Chair okay. Olson. Great, so we'll start with uh, Justin Terrell. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you, can you hear me okay? Is yep. my audio yep. okay? Yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself, Justin, for the record, and then proceed with your testimony. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Representative Olson. My name is Justin Terrell. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Justice Research Center, um, and I'm uh, thankful to be here. Uh, 
So racism as a public health crisis is a Minnesota problem that can be addressed in this body, um, along with the governor and the other body, um, should be aggressively pursuing innovative solutions to this public health problem, specifically around public safety to ensure our state becomes the standard for our country. My job is really easy today. Um, you don't need a research expert on criminal on the criminal legal system uh, or or uh, racial equity to know that Minnesota has a problem. Um, last week alone uh, in Minnesota, we saw failures to ex to address these issues once again um, on full display for the whole world to see. The killing of Amir Locke reveals the failure of the criminal legal system to make decisions in the interest of public safety to protect life uh, with with uh, while executing its investigative duties. Um, at the same time, the killing of Jamari Rice in Richfield, where my family lives, uh, reminds us that violent crime is up and people don't feel safe. Both incidents are reflections of how law enforcement is inequipped by themselves, inequipped by themselves to advance community safety. Um, yet we're seeing the same, old, and I'm just gonna mention this because I, I'm thankful to be here with with you all, but I'm gonna mention is that we are seeing the same old tired political debates about tough on crime versus soft on crime. And uh, we really need to be thinking about how to get smart on crime. Some of the measures in this report, we are discussing our steps in the right direction. Several of the policies that have been uh, passed have been uh, uh, done so with law enforcement community members at the, at the table together. Um, I, I don't know that we went through that part of the slide um, but you guys highlighted in the slides the, the areas that have been that have been passed. I'm help, I'm, I'm, there we go. Okay, so civil asset forfeiture, uh, stronger reporting and inspection requirements for correctional facilities. The hard, if you don't know the Hardell Sherrell story, um, it is something that every legislator concerned about these issues should be concerned with, um, should be familiar with. Uh, new regulations for no knock warrants. So uh, uh, Representative Hollins brought forth. Um, uh, proposal on no knock warrants last year and um, that was you know adopted in a pretty that I feel like could have been a more aggressive measure um, most of the focus of the of the bill focused on how to request and document uh, the use of knock, no knock warrants and we see the same sort of measure in Minneapolis where they made some changes to the policy um, I'll get back to my analysis of that in a moment but sign and release is a bill that passed that would have saved Dante Wright's life uh, potentially uh, surcharges and license revocations, uh, reforms from minor offenses on driver's licenses. Uh, that's a bill that the MNJRC worked on. And we can say is we're looking forward to the first report from the Department of Public Safety where we can analyze the impact of that bill, which is something I'll also come back to. Um, you know, you just heard a presentation on the work that we're doing to keep mothers and babies together and the, the, the need for black maternal health. Um, and then obviously establishing the Office of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives, but also the work that I know Representative Moran has done on the uh, Missing and Murdered African American Women as well. So we, we're taking some steps in the right direction is, is my point. Um, let me go back to my uh, notes here. <clears throat> and I just wanna re reiterate that law enforcement and community members are often at the table together doing this work. And that's not part of the dominant narrative, which is necessary if we're gonna address these racial disparities. Um, if we're gonna address these racial disparities in our state, we have to get beyond regulating just how no-knock warrants are requested and, and executed because they are being requested and executed in a culture that is feral and fails to recognize how the system has facilitated criminal activity in our communities. A better example, the patterns of uh, a police, a better example would be to look at the patterns of police brutality in the black community, which is often labeled or talked about as a black problem, which I know that this report is looking at racial disparities, I get that. But we have to get clear on the fact that police brutality is not an issue for black people. It is an issue for police. It is an issue for the criminal legal system. The same way we would look at issues of, um, uh, uh, you know, rape culture and sexual assault is not an issue for women, it is an issue for men because the, the predominant folks who commit those crimes are men. And so we have to have a conversation with men about that, the same way that police officers need to have a conversation with themselves about how they show up in our communities. 
Black folks rely on the police heavily. We are their number one clients in multiple communities across the state. I can think of one, Rochester, where 80% of their calls come from the Black community. Um, this reveals that um, we are the number one client and the services we are receiving are causing deeper harm. This reveals a clear misalignment between the, the criminal legal system and our communities, and this body needs to ensure the system moves into stronger alignment with the community. Once again, often community and law enforcement work together, so there are opportunities to actually do that. So as I start to wrap up my comments, because I think we're short on time, um, mm -hmm. I will just say that, you know, what is the cost? So Patrick Sharkey testified in uh, Representative Mariani's committee last week, and in his latest book, he talks about safe communities are necessary that people need to feel safe to go outside, to do business, to use public spaces, and that they can't thrive without feeling safe in their communities. And communities do actually fall into disrepair without safety. Um, communities who rely on the police but feel targeted by the police um, uh, develop other practices to protect themselves. So a quick story, and I do mean quick. So after the killing of, uh, of, of Jamari Rice out here in Richfield, I had the opportunity to sit with a bunch of kids at the local Young Life Club which is across the street from my house. And these are kids who don't go to Young Life, but most of them you know, are in relationship with caring, consistent adults who facilitate that space. And some of these kids, you hear about how they're talking and how heartbroken they are, what they wanna do in response to the murder of their friend. And you can't say that they're crazy because the, the next day you get a murder, uh, you get a killing by law enforcement. So why would they feel like they could trust law enforcement? When they're faced with violence every day in the street, and that's what they know, this is the pro this is the cost of the failures of our criminal legal system. So, the, so finally, I just want to say we have to act. We need to talk about these issues, which I'm thankful for the opportunity to do today. We need to take action and pass policies that we think will make a difference. But most importantly, like in the case of no knock warrants, we have to go beyond just reporting on the policies and start to evaluate these measures. We are not learning enough from what we're putting into public safety. We spend tons of money on it and, and we should in some respects do that, but it shouldn't just be a blank check. We have to evaluate the measures that officers are taking. So uh, Valerie Castile is a great example. So they passed a training a bill. You guys passed a bill that provided training dollars for officers, but you should ask Valerie Castile about how she feels about the effectiveness of those training dollars. And so this is something that I'm really trying to advocate for at the Minnesota Justice Research Center. We don't want to just see you guys pass policies and investments. We want to actually learn from what you're doing so that we can identify best practices in the community. And so my final, final talking point. And okay. I see, Wrap it up, Justin. Okay. Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, just real quick. I think this is important. Um, so in closing, uh, we often think about justice in terms of crime and punishment. Justice is a relational concept. It focuses on fairness, equity, accountability, and restoration. Imagine if we shifted our criminal legal system to focus on justice, where we treated people fair, distributed resources more equitably, held people accountable, which we don't do today. Let's be clear, our system does not hold people accountable, not just law enforcement, but also people who commit harm, who cause harm in the community and ensure that the end of the process was focused on restoration for all parties involved. Cornell West reminds us that justice is how we love each other in public. Bell Hook speaks about the same thing. I encourage this body when considering these issues about race, uh, racism as a public health issue to think about how the concept of love should be governing some of these ideas, specifically around public safety, um, love and justice. Um, thank you so much for your time. I apologize if I went over. Thank you for your testimony, Justin. We appreciate it. So our next testifier, and just being cognizant of the time, um, we'll do a little less than five minutes for the next testifier, and then hopefully we'll have some time for Chair Moran uh, to wrap up the rest of it, and we'll see if we can squeeze anything in after that. So we'll go to our next testifier. So welcome to the committee, Eliza Darris. If you could please introduce yourself for the record and begin with your testimony. Uh, you're on mute. Yes, there you go. Good morning, Chair Moran and distinguished members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Eliza Darris. I'm the co-executive director of the Minnesota Freedom Fund. I'm testifying before this committee today as a man 
who was formerly incarcerated, but who has fought for redemption and a new path forward. I have seen firsthand the excesses and abuses of the criminal legal system and how the current systems make it nearly impossible for people to remove themselves from the cycle of the system of incarceration. I have made it my mission to enhance public safety and community wellness by working to center the voices of those most directly impacted. As our public safety systems sit now, opportunities for redemption are often too reserved for communities with resources which are disproportionately white and wealthy. These communities are these communities with well-resourced schools where people have access to health care, including mental health services, where they have free or affordable programming for young people, where people are less likely to be arrested because of traffic offenses, drugs, property destruction, and interpersonal harm, where people can afford to pay bail if they are arrested so that an arrest doesn't lead to loss of a job or housing or family. These communities, as we know, are also safe communities. Why? Because the root causes of crime are addressed when people have what they need to thrive. Rarely do conversations about public safety include talk about the safety and well being of Black and Brown communities. But it's our communities that are experiencing the most harm under the status quo. Economic disinvestment makes Black and Brown people more likely to be impacted by violence. And we are also more likely to be harmed by the systems responsible for addressing violence. Now we have some lawmakers who are suggesting that we address public safety uh, concerns by criminalizing and incarcerating more people or by making it harder for people to engage in mutual aid and collective action or by blocking movements to address police violence. While research confirms more incarceration doesn't make us safer, studies demonstrate that the harm of incarceration is pronounced leading to fewer working age adults in the community increased exposure to infectious diseases, and more public resources shifted from health and social supports to jails and prisons. In our current system, Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities bear the overwhelming brunt of these harms. According to the Bureau Institute, the total jail population increased 18% between 2000 and 2015. Black people were incarcerated at 4.7 times the rate of white people, and for indigenous people, that was actually 11 times. In the 2017 ACLU report, uh, th they reported that these disparities were increasing. Here's the bottom line. We cannot double down on failed policies that have done nothing but decimate black, brown, and indigenous communities. We cannot be fooled by those who would sell us white supremacy thinly disguised as white security. Fortunately, this legislative session, we can pursue a more equitable, just, and inclusive vision. Here's some examples. We can reject an approach to public safety that is purely punitive and instead expand our view of public safety to include economic justice and security. We can keep working to end the racist, wealth-based cash bail system, curtail pretrial detention, and resist cynical attempts to block people from exercising their right to bail. No one should be in jail simply because they cannot afford to pay their bail, and no court should use excessive bail to keep a person who is legally innocent, uh, who, who is legally innocent and detained. We can make investments in youth recreational and school programming. We can increase input into and control of the criminal legal system by strengthening bodies like the Sentencing Guidelines Commission and also the Post Board. And in conclusion, at the, Minnesota Free at the Minnesota Freedom Fund, we recognize that all Minnesotans and all people really want and deserve to live in a safe, well-resourced community. We also believe that ramping up punitive systems will not deliver this promise to anyone least of all Black, Brown, and Indigenous people who are already um, most at disproportionate risk of violence and harm. Right now, four out of every six people in Minnesota jails are there pre-trial. 22,000 people without immigration status are also being detained. At the Minnesota Freedom Fund, we view these people and their safety and well-being as part of the public safety conversation. We refuse a view of public safety that presents them as disposable. Above all, I want to urge you to reject the terms of the current public safety debate. 
where the security of one community must be purchased by disinvesting from and destroying another. I want to invite you all instead to adopt a shared vision of public safety, where the goal of policy is to foster communities where we can all thrive and be safe. Thank you, Chair Moran, and thank you, uh, distinguished members of this committee. Thank you very much for the testimony to both our testifiers on this section. We appreciate you being here and to all the testifiers today. We won't have time to get through the rest of the slide deck. So if folks are, we did get through all the testifiers that are here, so thank you for that. But for members, you are able to review the rest of the slides that were sent out in your committee packet and we will happily put you in touch uh, via our staff to any of the testifiers if you have questions. But we do see Representative O'Neill's hand up, so we'll take her question if we can do it a little fast and then we'll turn it over to Chair Moran to wrap up. So Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a quick comment. So, um, we, you know, we have a historic violent crime problem in Minneapolis and St. Paul and surrounding area. In 2001, there were 741 carjackings. In other words, there was a gun put to someone's head and demanded their car for that. Um, I listened to a press conference where the interim police chief in Minneapolis said 29 juveniles had more than five violent felonies that they were charged with. And we know that juveniles in particular are detained and then released almost immediately. So we have an epidemic of violent crime. I don't think anybody disputes that in Minneapolis, St. Paul and the surrounding area. I'm from Wright County. We have seen that up there. So. I think the concern of Minnesota is to deal with the violent crime epidemic. It's something that we hear in the news continually. Um, I would go back to the previous test fire and the previous slide deck and look at the accomplishments that we've made. And I had a lot to do with many of those points that we made, that were uh, presented. Um, I am sure that we will have another conversation about no knock warrants. We will look at that in great detail. But I would just caution that this, um, the, I, the last presenter with his uh, concern about not, not having bail and things like that is, uh, is a scary concept, I think, for Minnesota right now is to get have someone arrested and then immediately released that had committed a very, very violent offense. When you have a gun put to your head, I think that is, um, a very scary situation. And like I said, 400, or excuse me, 741 violent carjackings happened, happened in Minneapolis and St. Paul just last year. So I, I would really caution moving forward to uh, entertain those sort of things because I think Minnesota wants safety and, um, and that's my concern. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. So Representative becker Finn, your hand came up. I know I said I was just gonna do Representative O'Neill, but if you can be super quick so we can give the last word to Chair Moran, that would be great. Thank you. I uh, Thank you, Representative Olson, and did wanna just quick respond as someone who has worked on bail issues and been a prosecutor who has asked for bail. And the question around bail is whether um, because of somebody's income, whether they should spend more time in jail. And the courts make decisions about setting bail based on the the violence and the risk to the community. And the question before us is whether someone with lower income should sit in jail longer than somebody that with higher income. It is not necessarily a matter of uh, the danger and the risk of the person who's being held. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you all members. We went through a lot today. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Chair Moran for our final wrap up on this section. Thank you, Chair Olson. So I, I would like to thank all the testifiers, the expert testifiers who have come from the community, who are impacted by a system, who has an insight into the solutions. So I'm hoping that we are open enough to hearing from the community what those solutions can look like and the impact they will have on the outcomes of strengthening individuals and families and community. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jamie Becker, uh, Chair Becker Finn, for her response to the bail piece because we have murderers who are able to, you know, pay their way out of uh, of a bail and continue to be in the community. 
It's based on income. And so we have an opportunity and obligations to spend our money diligently to have different outcomes. And so as legislators of a hundred year of being uh, a system that has tipped the scale for the white population is impacting who we are today and how we still see the world. So we all have an opportunity now to, to do our research, to do better, be better, and do some really good investment. Thank you all for um, being here today. We have a great day. Thank you. So with that, members, we are adjourned. <laughs>